Good morning. I'm sorry I'm not going to be speaking in Spanish, but I hope you'll understand and uh, the translations will work. We're going to shift our attention from the brain to the whole health system, and I'm going to focus on something I have been doing research on for the last 25 years, on the decentralization of healthcare systems, which in Chile you've done for primary health care to the municipalities especially. So we're going to talk about decentralization uh, in a very short time. Uh, one of the things to think about about decentralization that's important is that it should not be an end in itself. We need to think about what we want to achieve by changes in a health system that we want to do. And decentralization should be oriented toward achieving other objectives. And at Harvard, we've been focusing on these kinds of objectives for any health system and particularly for the decentralized health systems. We want to, as almost anyone involved in public health or in, in clinical health care, wants to improve the health status of the people in the country. Right? That's the main objective that many people have focused on. But we also want to be sure that the population and the patients are satisfied with the health system that they have. And as we learned in October in Chile, People are not very happy with the health system as it exists, even if it has progressed and has improved over time. We also want to make sure that there's financial risk protection, meaning that if people get sick, they don't have, they, they're not excluded from using the health system because they don't have enough money to be covered. So we want to have health systems that cover people so that they can get attention when they need it. And overall, we don't want a health system that's better for the wealthy and not for the poor, we want to improve equity in the whole health system. And we can do this by improving access, making sure that people can get to the kinds of services that they need or that they get public health messages as well. And secondly, we want to improve the quality of the healthcare services. And this is a particularly important issue now in Chile. And thirdly, we realize that it's not just increasing funding for health care that's going to bring a better health system because we never can get enough funding for health. We need to improve the efficiency and the use of the resources that we have. Even in the United States, where we spend 18% of our GDP on health, we don't feel we're spending enough. And that's not the problem. Part of the problem is efficiency. So, for decentralization, we want to think of how it can achieve these kinds of objectives. And at Harvard, we developed a way of thinking about decentralization that focuses first on what I call the decision space. This means the amount of choice that's allowed to people at the municipal level, in this case, or at the states or province levels or regional levels, the amount of choice they have over different functions of the health system. And this is, I think, a contribution that Harvard has made. And we've also done some studies that show there's a relationship between the decision space that people have at local level and their capacities to make good decisions with that decision space. So we want to think about the training and the resources and the type of people that are able to make those decisions. We also want to be sure that they're held accountable for making good decisions. And so we want to think about how we can make them more accountable, both at the local level for local interest and local priorities, but also at the national level for the national priorities for a health system. So decision space, what does it mean? What would we be focusing on? One of the things that we want to do is to break down the kind of functions that can be transferred from the central government to local governments and we've identified broad areas, broad areas, financing, the, the, how you fund a system is very important. And particularly in decentralization, how much of the funding comes from transfers from the central government to the local government? And what is the relationship between the local government's own sources of funds, their taxes and their other funding sources in the health system? Because that's an important relationship. Secondly, we want to know how much choice they're going to have at local levels about what kind of services are going to be available, when they're going to be open, what kinds of services and referral systems are going to be put in place between the primary system and the secondary and tertiary systems. 
A very important area is human resources. How much choice do local authorities have over hiring, firing, and promoting and paying the different health workers? And that's an important area in decentralization. And governance. How do you structure the way people are able to make decisions? Is it done by the mayor? Is it done by the corporation of health, of, of health and, and education? Is it done by just the health officials themselves? So that's an important kind of issue to also look at. And it's not just those areas, it's how much choice is allowed over each of those in your decentralized system. And at Harvard, we developed a tool, which we call the map of decision space, that is broken down to those broad, broad uh, functions financing, service organization, human resources, and sub-functions sub, uh, within each of them. And we've tried to focus on the other columns, narrow, moderate, and wide for the range of choice that's allowed, so that we see that some, that are, where some of these functions are going to be narrow for the local officials and decided at the central level. Some are going to be wide, they're going to not, they're, the local officials can make almost any choice they want to make. And then others will be able to make some choice, but that choice will be limited to some extent. I'm going to show you a study that we did. This will be hard to see. I always tell my students, you shouldn't do this. I want to show you a study that we done, we, we've done uh, several years ago in three of the countries in Latin America that everyone said were very decentralized, Chile, Colombia, and Bolivia. And we used teams in each, in each uh, country to have a fairly systematic way of defining what the functions were and what narrow, moderate, and wide meant. And what you can see is in each of the cells that the, uh, the, the country uh, that has narrow, moderate, or wide is in those cells. And if you look carefully at this, the narrow functions are the majority of the functions. So in even the three countries that everyone said were highly decentralized, many of the choices were still centralized. So we don't have a system in decentralization where everything is transferred to anyone else. In fact, in most cases, most of the functions are still centralized. And very few of them are wide, so you don't see very many uh, choices that don't have any restrictions. The other, the other functions are moderate where they can make some choice, but it's fairly limited, and interestingly enough, in finance, we see that moderate range of choice is, is allowed in all three countries for most of the sub-functions in that area. But in human resources, in salaries, and contracts, and civil service, that tends to be centralized in many countries. That's one of the results that we found in this. And if we summarize that, we see then that in Latin America, for the countries that everyone said were very decentralized, still many of the functions are still controlled by the central government. Some of the, the other functions are moderately controlled and very few are, are uh, wide in terms of letting people that make the kind of decisions that they want. Uh, and one thing that we found was that in many countries, one or two of the functions are changed over time. They're either centralized or they're decentralized more. And you can do that, and, and countries do that, without changing the whole overall structure of the decentralized system. <clears throat> We've been doing studies from this for many years. This is a recent publication that we did on federal systems, which are not like Chile, but they're fairly similar. Uh, and they have similar kinds of outcomes. We did a study of eight of them and published it at the University of Toronto Press. Uh, and other studies, as you can imagine, I get a lot of uh, uh, journal uh, manuscripts and I review a lot of the, of the studies that do come out on decentralization. And what we do is we find that there's a great variety of decision space among different countries. We find that <clears throat> as we did in the, in the Latin American case, that many functions are still centralized in, in, in most countries. We do find the importance of the financing uh, function if the central government provides most of the resources for the local authorities to use, then they tend to control many more of the other functions. 
Right? So if you want to have a more decentralized system, you should probably have a greater contribution from the local government to have more control over what they want to do. Right? We did a study several years ago with Osvaldo Larenaga, who was at, at that time at the University of Chile, that showed something that I think is very important to understand about decentralization. It showed that in Chile and Colombia, where we did this study in, in two teams, we found that we could create a more equitable health system by, uh, by decentralizing. And let me show you some of the findings of that. This, this, chart, this chart shows you for Colombia, which was the extreme case. Down the left-hand side, the deciles from the poorest to the richest municipalities the first column is the last, the last centralized budget of the Colombian government. And you can see, if you look at the yellow uh, lead, uh, numbers at the bottom, the, the funds for each of the deciles, the richer communities were getting six times more than the poor in terms of per capita funding. Right? So it was a very unequal system even though it was centralized. After three years, you can see that the national funds, because they used the formula to reassign them based on, on population, were almost equal, right? From six times difference to only 1.2 times difference. And that, that shows you that you can improve the equity of a system by decentralizing and using a formula. The other thing that we found in this study that was a surprise was that looking at the blue numbers, the own source revenue, the money that the, that the municipalities put into their health systems, in the, in the centralized government, the poorest communities or the richest communities were spending 42 times more than the poor communities. Right? That's a significant difference, and it's not surprising. Wealthy communities have more re resources, they can put more in. But what we saw with the process of decentralization was that the poor communities increased their funding 10 times, partly because they had, their, they had responsibility for more of their health system. And the poor, rich communities only increased it three times. Right? So the gap between the rich and the poor Re was reduced from, six, from 42 times to only 12 times difference. So you can see that in the process of decentralization, you can improve the equity of the health system. This is, this is the data from Chile, and I think it's very interesting because it shows, unlike in Colombia, where the own source revenues go from a small amount to the, to, the, to the larger amount in a kind of gradation growth. In Chile, in Chile we see that the poor communities actually put in more than the next to the rich communities. Right? So the poor communities were, were, and almost that whole set of deciles, except for the wealthiest communities like Santiago and Valparaiso and, and Concepcion, which are very wealthy communities relative to the others, they almost all had about the same amount of money. And this is because in Chile, they had a municipal common fund that took some money from the wealthiest communities and redistributed it to the poor. And so it improved the ability of the poor municipalities to have enough resources to make this kind of contribution. And that's another tool that you can use to try to improve equity through decentralization. We did a recent study in, in the 2015, we collected data with Ronnie Lentz from the Instituto de Salud Pública Andres Bello and we found that the same kind of equity that was produced in the 1990s has continued for the last 20, 25 years, right? And so it was great, it was maintained. This kind of reform is sustainable and it was able to, able to maintain itself. One of the concerns though is that we found that the amount of funding that the, that the municipalities were actually putting in was declining and as I said, with other studies, we found that this means that the central government is likely to have more of a say in the kind of decisions that are made at the local level because the local governments are, 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 don't have as much money in the game. 
One of the solutions for that is that the central government could have a matching grant that says to municipalities, we will give you a certain amount of money to do things if you bring in additional funding. And when I talk about decentralization in many other places, I talk about this as a way of generating more resources in the health sector by using the matching grant mechanism. And it also strengthens the ability for local governments to make decisions. So we also did some studies in Pakistan. Uh, in Pakistan, we showed also that there's a great variety of, dis of, of decision space differences even among one, in one country among the different districts. We also found that there was a relationship between the capacities, we, we, we measured the capacities with a variety of indicators, and the accountability mechanisms to the local officials and also to the central government that those districts that had more capacity and better accountability also had wider decision space. They were able to make more decisions. So that shows at least some indication that it's important when you think about decentralization to think about those three factors. How much decision space there should be, how much capacity you have to make good decisions with that decision space, and how much accountability that you actually have. So one of the problems that I have as a scientist and trying to do studies like this is that it's very difficult to find ways of showing that decentralization is good or bad because there are a variety of problems with doing those kinds of studies. The first one is that many countries that start de to decentralize uh, they also start to do other things. They change the way they're financing. They move from a tax system to an insurance system or some other ways of financing. Or they pay people uh, who are providers a different way. And that means that it's hard for us to isolate what the effect of decentralization is on those objectives that we laid out at the beginning. Right? So it's hard to do some of these kinds of studies. Those that have shown some difficulties in decentralization, and there have been a variety of studies on immunization coverage and things like that that show in the initial stages, the, the coverage for immunization when they decentralized to municipalities meant that the, the coverage went down. But in most cases, over time, over the longer time period, the capacities to make better decisions are developed. The accountability is also developed and we see that decentralization may actually end up with better coverage over time. So what I've done by reviewing many of the different studies that have been done recently on, on, uh, on decentralization is found that, uh, that most of the systems have improved by decentralizing, at least if you compare it to what was happening under the centralized system. So to conclude about the future, and thinking about the future, right? It's not so important to think about whether you want to decentralize, but if you decide to decentralize, as Chile has, then the problem is to think about how to do it well. And to think about that, you need to think about what kind of decisions do you want local officials to be able to make, make sure that they have the capacities to make good decisions that they're allowed to make, and make sure that there are mechanisms to hold them accountable to the higher authorities, the national priorities, and to the local population that they're going to, that they're going to serve. Thank you very much.